Uh, our next uh, discussion will be about uh, the good causes and universal values and social responsibilities uh, in esports. And so, as we uh, get the couches up onto the stage, these are going to be the upgrade from the chairs that we had earlier. So we'll. Uh, be waiting for those to be on the stage. Uh, like I said, good causes, universal values, and social responsibilities in esports. So while we continue to get this uh, set up, let me go ahead and begin welcoming our panelists on to the stage. Don't read the slides, that's a spoiler. So <laughs> here we go. Uh, first and foremost, Miss Charmaine Crooks, CEO of NGU Consultants, Chair of Olympians Canada, and former member of the IOC Athle Athletes Commission. Next, Magnus Johnson, board member of IESF and chairman of the Sweden Esports Federation. Next, Mr. Yevhen Zolotorov, current managing director for Navi Esports Team. Next, Akihito Furosawa-san, board director of the Japan Pro Esports Federation and senior manager for Logitech Japan. Mr. David Yarnton, Director of Gfinity and Chairman of Esports for UK Interna Interactive Entertainment and former Senior Executive of Nintendo. And finally, Mr. Pavel Varbe, Project Manager at Wargaming. Please give our panelists a round of applause as we begin our panel discussion. All right, thank you all for joining us, and I uh, do want to welcome you all to our panel discussion on good causes and universal values in esports uh, today. Uh, we'll be talking about some of the social responsibilities that esports uh, companies, organizations, players have as we uh, move towards a, uh, a better environment here in esports. So just to start things off, uh, as we look towards esports as more than just video games or you know, sports as more than just athletes uh, exerting themselves, uh, what are some of the good causes in uh, sports and esports and why are they necessary? Uh, start off with Ms. Crooks. Um, thank you very much, and it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you very much to the organizers for, for having me as a, as a guest from all the way from Canada. Um, first, I'd like to just say that um, when it comes to values, we are all connected by the universal values that allow us to be citizens, that allow us to build uh, communities, that allow us to truly engage not just with our sport, but also with our fans and the athletes, the eSport athletes and the traditional athletes, that's uh, my background, where we can really use our voice and as role models to make positive change within communities. And there are so many organizations, I'm sure we'll be speaking about a lot of them, which really align with these values. So for the eSport community, it's about looking at who are those organizations? What are those organizations that authentically align with eSport and what they want to do to help to promote the sport and also to give back to the communities? Absolutely, about giving back to the community is so, when it comes to the universal values uh, in whether it's traditional or uh, official sports or esports, uh, what are some of those universal values that we should, uh, that we should be working towards? Okay, yeah, um, I thought about this and I got back to when I was younger, I played a lot of sports, um, obviously I'm not as talented as Miss Crooks here, but um, and I remember the, the clubs that I, that I was a member of, and they helped me so much, all the adults around the clubs, doing so much work, so much volunteer work, managing the club, driving us around to the games, managing our teams, coaching us. Um, we all actually, when I played table tennis, I had a coach who represented Sweden on an international level, and he just coached me well, for free, me and some other boys and girls, 
for free because he loved table tennis and he wanted to give that back to, to the new generation. But in esports, we don't really see those kinds of clubs. Um, we do see a lot of pro teams, but there are very few teams for the amateur level and the young people. And I think we, we really need to work towards that because that's where you learn all these like, values that makes you a better person. You learn the values of team spirit, of loyalty, of, and if it's a non-profit uh, non organization, you also learn about democracy. And I think we, we need more of this also in esports. And to go along with that, uh, to Yevon from Navi, uh, as the managing director for one of the biggest esports uh, organizations in the world, how uh, are you going about incorporating uh, the greater values and uh, I into your team? Well, uh, we are working currently with gamers that became gamers by themselves. Uh, we were not helping them uh, to become better people <coughs> with. Uh, right, correct values, etc. So now we as Navi and all other big organizations should build their academies to, be, to uh, do gamers like from scratch, uh, to make them good, not only good uh, players, but good people with right values. Absolutely. And uh, to Furusawa san, uh, about the uh, situation of esports in, I guess, specifically Japan, but also uh, in general, what are some of the, the good causes and values that you're seeing being uh, developed in esports there? So, that's, thank you for first three years. Thank you for inviting for the great opportunity to see you all. Uh, Japan esports is uh, just started. Japan as an economy is really, uh, you know, for develop, you know, you know it's huge and big. But uh, in terms of the esports market, is Japan is uh, just started as a developed country, and uh, you know, first thing as a federation of the pro Japan esports federation, that we are looking at the uh, kind of a acceptance, understanding of the for the esports, the people see as a game is not not, ne not necessary to the, all the time to be a good thing, but there is so much on the you know for the stereotype. For instance, uh, today's the one of the Japanese guests. There is uh, you know for the VP. Uh, the for you know for Sony uh, you know for the PR communication uh, today and uh, we shared uh, you know for salt yesterday that when you are aged to 22 or 23 by the time you're graduating from a university that playing a football or a baseball is a people there is acceptance understanding as a good causes but playing a game there is stereotype right so those are kind of fundamental thing in Japan we need to give a proper you know kind of education understanding. Uh, to start investment education is so all together. All right, there's definitely a need for acceptance uh, between uh, the perception of traditional sports as well as uh, esports. And uh, moving down the panel uh, as well to continue to talk about maybe the social responsibilities uh, that we have as a society to be a part of esports uh, and even traditional sports. Uh, what is some of that uh, acceptance? Moving on to maybe Mr. Yarton to talk about his involvement there. Hopefully that one works. Um, I think when we're talking about social success and, and, and good causes, part of that uh, necessity is for us to be considered to be more socially acceptable in society and make a contrib contribution to society is because I'm going to take a little bit of a commercial lean on it, is, is that acceptance, general acceptance, means that sponsors and other people um, would be happy to participate. If you have a very narrow um, and, and you're exclusive rather than being inclusive, um, a lot of sponsors, if there's any controversy, so I think one of the big things we've found issues uh, with esports going back a little bit, and hopefully it's changing, has been with female participation. And so we really need to be looking at um, the sort of inclusiveness there, uh, because as I say, sponsors, if they see any controversy, won't want to get involved. But it's also about growing. Uh, as I say, acceptance. And esports is in a really good position to do something there because if you look at it compared to other sports, um, yeah, male and female can play when you're doing it online. You don't know who you're playing. It could be someone with a disability. Uh, it, it cuts down language barriers, uh, ge geography, cultural differences because you all become quite equal when you're in, in that uh, um, space. Um, I think in the UK there's a company, well, say company that's a not-for-profit uh, not called Special Effects which enables uh, disabled people to be able to play nearly all of the games uh, as such. So 
by, by, by participating, it helps break, break down those barriers and make esports more socially acceptable to society. Lots of barriers being broken down. Now, we have representatives on our panels from esports uh, teams and even uh, tournament organizers, but uh, at the very end, uh, Mr. Varbe from uh, Wargaming, uh, as a uh, publisher for uh, an esports title, uh, what are some of the thoughts and concerns that uh, you have about uh, involving good causes and universal values in esports? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, uh, from a publisher side, um, working with esports, um, we like have a challenges with acceptance of players, esports players as um, um, persons that uh, does a real job or something like this. So we are working towards um, um, bringing some like universal values and showing that uh, career of esportsmen is the same. Uh, job as every single else, and um, we're working with um, our community and special in in general uh, to give uh, to, to give an understanding that uh, esportsman is uh, when you're playing the game, you're not losing your time, and you like, can achieve a great success as well. Lots of successes possible, and uh, in moving forward, uh, talking about those successes, uh, when it comes to players uh, moving past even just their careers professionally, uh, and maybe I can direct this to you, Charmaine, um, what are some of the ways that uh, they can then give back to the other esports athletes to uh, continue that mentorship process? Well, I think one of the ways that we do is, first of all, we come together as a community, the global community, and uh, share best practices from uh, different industries. I think that that's really important. But there are some foundational tools which are available from other organizations, from other sports, that I really believe that eSport can adapt to uh, make it their own. And those include looking at the pathway for the athlete. I know we're going to talk more later about the athlete segment. But really, looking at the athlete as from a holistic point of view, that, that an athlete comes into a sport just like I did when I was, you know, 10 years old, and, you know, you have that pathway that you go, but along the way, you know, it, you always go back to those foundational values that allowed you to come in the sport, but the system also has to be set up for your success as well, whether it's your uh, health, you know, success through your health, you know, success through your transition, and all those different things, but it all points back to those, those values, right? And we use those ba values as a beacon um, in order to build our personal platforms, the branding platform, the marketing platform, and we never really waver from that. But there are a lot of tools that are available. I mean, we don't have to always reinvent the wheel on everything. We can take some of the practices that have been successful, adapt them, and uh, utilize them to, to eSport in, you know, in particular. Absolutely, and uh, maybe for uh, Mr. Johnson, um, you were mentioning earlier about not seeing evidences of ways uh, to increase either mentorship or involvement of the youth. Um, maybe you could uh, speak a little bit more about programs that you would like to see develop to increase uh, you know, the involvement of esports and good causes uh, amongst the community or younger members. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I would like to uh, look at the, our friends in South Africa. They do a lot of good work. They already have the traditional structure going for them. So they have the clubs. They're doing what, what clubs are supposed to do. So they already, already have this rotation going on. And I think all the ISF na nation members should try to look at that and see what they can do in their country to in inspire the same ideas, to create the clubs where where you feel a loyalty to so you. When I, if I am a pro player, I can go back to that club later because I feel for that club, so I will teach the new generation in that club. I would like to add that they need to see the roadmap from the school till the end of career. If I could just add to, to some of what uh, he just talked about is you also have to have a very strong governance structure and a strong leadership structure that allows some consistency amongst the many or organizations. I think that's also a very big part of it. Absolutely, and I think that's uh, sort of the, the main topic is, well, out of all of these good causes and structures and values, well, 
how do we go about uh, introducing those as things that are necessary uh, in every step along the way. And that's, that's uh, what Yevon was mentioning is that uh, as an esports athlete, you know, your time is, is not about just the immediate, but also about the future and then empowering the past or, uh, the, the past or even younger athletes uh, in their futures uh, as well. So lots of, lots of good causes out there. And uh, I'm glad we're starting to have a discussion about sort of the, the timeline of, uh, of all of that. And maybe uh, you could emphasize that a little bit more, Yevon, about uh, your players and teams, especially in a very unique uh, situation. Well, timeline is not defined yet because mm -hmm. I have guys that, like, my age, 30 years plus, they are still playing. Prize funds are huge. They don't want to retire. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> Right, so, the, so there is a, a very long timeline. Uh, I think there's a general perception that uh, esports athletes' uh, timelines are very limited, uh, but that's definitely not always the case, uh, as uh, Yevon was talking about. Uh, it's not n limited to you know, 18 to 22. You can extend much longer uh, past that in, uh, as an esports athlete. So keeping the entire uh, timeline in mind uh, is very important and educating esports athletes in that, uh, another good cause that we can talk about. So maybe and moving... It, it's easier to work with old school guys. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the reasons is because they've had so many experiences that maybe newer athletes aren't aware of but could be made aware of as part of some of these uh, programs. So... Uh, to move forward uh, with our discussion uh, to Furusawa-san about uh, social acceptance of esports and that being one of the good values, uh, what are some of the ways that you would like to see esports uh, accepted by society that you think would help it? But uh, it's a part of not only the acceptance, but I think uh, for the responsibility uh, is uh, so important. It's, as you mentioned, that uh, you know, age 16 to maybe a 20 to 3, third in 23 is about kind of a maximum age. Uh, for current top player in the esports field today. But uh, for in Japan right now, the, uh, in a, this year, esports dedicated schools that just founded in, a, in, a, in April. So uh, the over 90% of the students is uh, participated to aim to become pro professional esports player. But for, in, compared from uh, in a traditional sports, like you know, less than 10% can be uh, really professional, right? The less they have passion, so I think that part of the responsibility in society uh, like us is that we need to offer uh, to uh, meet their kind of needs, uh, to, to uh, give an opportunity to find a job which can be the commentator, which can be the organizer, how to make the attractive esports event, and so on. So I think that you know, prayer is not only the solution, but we really need to uh, think and offer the opportunity uh, related to the esports, but outside of the athlete. Well, that's very true. Uh, very extensive opportunities within esports within e uh, that uh, we can maybe talk about. So maybe uh, moving down, uh, the, uh, down the line to Mr. Yarnton, um, as an, a tournament organizer, what are some of the, uh, the opportunities that uh, are presented to you or that you would like to see taken uh, to in continue to in encourage good causes in esports? Um. I just sort of wanted to backtrack a little bit to what we were talking about. Absolutely. Um, with, to some extent with players. And I think it's one of the sort of things that people with eSports, you don't see too many old players. Not everyone afterwards can become a caster or a commentator. And yet they had that sort of impression. They, you know, when I finish playing, I'll move on to do other things. And we tend to lose people to eSports, so to speak. They might follow it watching TV or watching, watching it. But... It means that it becomes a transient type of sport where there's not that ongoing uh, commitment and uh, for society to accept it. So I think there's opportunity um, for the, the players afterwards to maybe get more involved, as we're talking about there. And I'd like to steal um, a, a, an idea that from, from traditional sports, and there's a, a, an organisation called uh, the Loris uh, Sports Awards, and uh, that's made up of X world um, champion athletes, whether it be from car racing, um, you know, uh, tennis, um, football, all, all sports. There's only about 50, of, 50 uh, members. They've got about 400 or more ambassadors. And what they say is that sport is a tool for social change. And I think esports is very much that opportunity for that. 
And I don't want to sort of be too, um, I want to say preaching with it. I'm going to have to borrow uh, something because I wanted to um, just show to, to what we can probably achieve more to some extent than Loris because of our uh, appeal to youth. And when Loris was set up in uh, 2000, the first patron uh, was Nelson Mandela. And uh, basically, he, he uh, quoted, and I don't have to read this because I think it's quite, I want to say powerful, but also, as I say, shows the opportunity we have to do, to do good. He says, sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. And I think that opportunity with esports, talking to youth, and it's, uh, if we can have very good uh, values and principles, can uh, act as a shining light for the future. Absolutely. And that's spoken about traditional uh, official sports, but also very true of esports as an example to a very young demographic who are you know, looking towards it for examples. Uh, like you were, uh, you were mentioning. Well, sorry, I didn't really answer your question, though, did I? <laughs> I'm still waiting. <laughs> Can you repeat it? <laughs> uh, absolutely. It was as uh, your unique role as a no. tournament organizer. Yeah, no, actually, um, we have a number of instances where we have, uh, when I want to say, special organizations that want to come down, and so we give them that opportunity, um, uh, as I must say, uh, uh, educa in an educational sense. Um, we provide um, lectures to people that want to understand esports as, as such from outside, but uh, a lot of the time we have, want to say, I was going to say, youth groups uh, come down, um, and we try and point out that it's not just about playing games. Um, there is a lot of work, hard work involved, um, which helps, uh, as I say, give these kids uh, some sort of uh, uh, targets to aim for. So it's it's um, not a, not a you know, huge numbers, but it's more about uh, spreading the gospel, so to speak, um, and working. Uh, what we've done to try and do with our facilities is work with people like Special Effect that we can include, uh, be inclusive uh, rather than exclusive. Right, and I think the uh, the opportunity for esports to be inclusive, something you touched on a little bit earlier, is uh, very very powerful and definitely one of the the good causes and values uh, that esports. Has, uh, has in mind. Uh, so I, I guess I'd like to open it up uh, to our entire panel and we'll have a Q&A session so we can open it up a little bit more later. Uh, but any, any final thoughts on good causes or universal values in esports uh, that you would like to see moving forward? Well, just that uh, the idea of the, of the athletes as role models is, is very important and highly valued uh, to the fans because the fans also want, are very interested in what their, their stars are, are also interested in uh, as well. They're great influencers for many charities. I know I've been involved with, uh, you know, Laureus is great, uh, Peace and Sport. I'm part of one of the many champions who are promoting peace through sport around the world. So there's countless ones. But again, I think it comes back to being authentic. It comes back to being... To, you know, to being relevant to the sport, but I think uh, that these role models are looked up to by the fans. And again, the base of the foundational base of those values is what's going to grow the sport, grow the fan, fan base, and make it even more relevant to the marketers and uh, continue to grow it. It's a big part of it. Yeah, yeah, they're not just buying the same peripherals. They're acting like they're a ce favorite celebrities and gamers. All right. Uh, it looks like uh, we have somewhat exhausted the uh, topics here. Of course, we could speak about this for, for much, much longer. But I'd actually like to open up the floor to a more extensive Q&A this time around. Uh, so uh, be able to take quite a few questions uh, or comments from anyone in the audience. So if you uh, would like to participate, just go ahead and raise your hands, and we'll get a microphone out to you as quickly as possible. Uh, let's see. Looking for hands. All right. Right over here at uh, this table. Okay, let's start with uh, Alex. Hi, uh, my name is Alex, uh, coming from ISF. Um, I have a question um, to Charmaine. Um, as a big fan of you, uh, five times Olympians, and uh, I'm a big fan of Canucks Stoop. Thank you. Uh, Me too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Go Canucks, go. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, talking about the universe value, I, I want to uh, seek for advice about more universe. Um, I kind of think that um, the global redistribution uh, from the developed countries to the uh, developing countries, um, um, the tra traditional sports field has been um, uh, working on it pretty good. And as eSports is quite connected with the uh, sports concept as well as the uh, IT culture, um, the current global gaps between these uh, countries uh, actually not only the resources, not only the uh, capitals, but the uh, gaps on that um, information and technology may uh, make these uh, differences between countries right now. So um, I have this idea that um, esports industry can may help uh, or bring or set up the channel to bring this um, IT culture coming from the developed countries to the developing countries, but I don't know the way how to do it. So, uh, as Sherman, you've been working and uh, promoting this, you know, universe value all the time, and uh, you've been the uh, clean up charity. So, uh, I think you made me uh, have the answer for it. Well, there's a, gee, that's quite a long uh, opportunity to discuss this, but I think in principle, and having it as a principle, I think is really important as one of the foundation of values, just like the Olympic movement does and a lot of sports do. I think it's also important to look at seeing how we enter that. What is the, I mean, obviously there are some obvious technical barriers to entry in some of these countries where, you know, they don't have access to, to certain basic fundamental, uh, you know, um, privileges as we do, much less the technology piece that allows us to do eSport. So I think it's important to look at what are the barriers of entry and how can we adapt that. I know with, with sport we can adapt the equipment very easily to, 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 to certain, uh, you know, um, environments. So we have to look at that, but I, I think it, we have to start very slow, and I know there are some things happening with some major tech industries around the world who are bringing that more to some of these developing countries and reaching it, but I think that we shouldn't give up. We should do it very, you know, try now, work with existing partners, and, uh, and I think that will grow in time. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Any other follow-up questions? Yes, right over here. Hi, this is Felipe Montoya from Costa Rica, and the question I had is, what steps are being taken like from an organization perspective, from the producer perspective, to showcase the value of esports, not only current value, but as a lasting discipline, right? Because that's one of the main problems we have found when trying to showcase esports to media, to, to a traditional sports team, and to other uh, interested parties in our countries. Uh, they, they don't see it as a lasting thing, because as you discussed before, some athletes, or most, most of the eSport athletes, have a career lasting for two to five years maybe. Some, and it depends on the game, may last longer, but we don't really have a way to promise there will be a career for an eSports athlete, and it's something that really worries me. I think there is a need to build a healthy, sustainable ecosystem, like an environment for athletes, and I'm not sure what tools or to what uh, programs are in place to do this. So, uh, countries like Costa Rica, which are just starting the esports um, road, look f up to maybe Sweden, to Korea, which have a lot, uh, have gone a long way on it, and want to learn from them. So, I want to know what steps are being taken towards this sustainable, healthy environment for people to have a career in esports after the athlete's career have ended. Um, okay, I think we will touch a lot of this in the next panel as well, but just briefly. Um, in Sweden, you, there's a lot of traditional teams, uh, traditional sports, now looking to esports because we can reach the younger audience. The traditional sports now have problems reaching the younger audience, so they are now looking to esports to help them um, gather the younger population into their traditional sports. And there's also uh, the ISF has a partnership with the Athletics Federation just to address this, and this is globally. So you could actually talk to the Costa Rican Athletics Federation just um, about this issue, and and they and you can probably help each other in just this. 
Thank you. Can, I'll add, can I add a couple of things to that? Um, Absolutely. As such. Um, I just want to use a bit of personal experience going back when I was at Nintendo. Um, when you look in 2008, 2010, um, with video games were probably not very well socially accepted right across the board. You know, it was the perception of the uh, 16 to 24 year old male in his bedroom playing. Um, the the uh, male female mix was about 90% male. So we set ourselves a target to grow the market by changing that model. And uh, initially, our target audience was 10 to 60. And then our president turned around and said, no, let's make it 5 to 95. Uh, which is quite wide in the marketing sense, and uh, we ended up with our uh, female participate or playing up to in the UK at least of about 49% uh, female players, and we obviously had the right products and things to help with that, but it helped change the social acceptance a lot for video games. I think with esports, we're in a sort of similar situation where, if you look at the the mix being you know predominantly male, as we change and encourage females in there, um, we'll get that sort of widening, and then that's the opportunity for age as well. And perhaps, you know, potentially we should be looking at, say, some Masters tournaments um, where it is for older players only. Um, you know, golf has a Masters tournament uh, as well. So an opportunity for players that once they've potentially finished professionally full-time but actually do still compete, but people are their peers. And I think that will help grow as, as well uh, if we're having older, as you say, older people to do after the, afterwards. All right, we have time for a few more questions. So it looks like we have a question right over here. Uh, hello, my name is Koen Scholbert. Um, from the Netherlands. I have a question kind of to all of you. Um, I recently read an article about the uh, famous Brazilian player Adriano. Uh, he went into the drugs world back in uh, Brazil, even though he had a really successful career, earned millions. Um, so there are systems for football players to continue a career in football. Uh, look at Van der Star, a Dutch uh, uh, keep the goalkeeper. It's the same with eSport players. They can have the chances and the systems to continue a career, but you have to trigger them to follow the system or trigger them to take the chance, or else you will lose them. So how will you trigger them, and how will you continue to trigger the new upcoming players to continue in esports and not just fly away? Should we answer this at the topic of our next panel? I don't know. I'm in the next panel as well, so I'm right. fine. Right. <laughs> that question specifically, if we can just hold off on that for a little bit, will be answered in our next upcoming panel. So uh, it's very important, but we will be talking more extensively about that. All right. I uh, think right over here at the front table. Uh, hi, my name is Yusuf uh, Mossen. I'm from uh, the Egyptian Federation. Uh, before I ask you the question, I just want to tell every single person in this room that I just want to hug all of you because you have no idea how much lives you're changing. Or m many of you do. From the press to the Federation representatives to every single person in this room, you have no idea how many lives you're changing. It, it makes me very emotional because when I went back to Egypt, uh, I left my studies. I couldn't continue because... Uh, uh, there's 40,000 cyber cafes in Egypt, there's 2 million gamers, and there is no, there's not even one professional esports team. The federation was extremely corrupt. They used to take the tickets for the conference and the tournament to have fun with them and just go to Indonesia, South Korea, and Turkmenistan or Azerbaijan. I don't remember where, where the last year where it was held. But uh, I just wanted to talk to David. I'm sorry, I couldn't remember your name. I have a problem with my memory. Uh, you touched every single thing I wanted to talk about, about hope. This is hope. You cannot imagine the amount of people I've met because I started Egypt's first uh, professional gaming team and the players didn't believe me. When I approached them and I told them I get them a gaming house, I get them proper internet, I get them proper hardware, all of these things without even, they, they thought I wanted money from them. Like they didn't even think I'd give them a salary. And when I actually did give them a salary and when, when, they, when their parents found out they were like, a guy is going to give you some money to play games in an apartment, uh, we have to meet this guy. So, so when I actually went to meet them, they were, they were, they were amazed. They thought their, their children were failures. Because if you really think about it, gamers, and this is very depressing, gamers are, are geniuses. This is, this is the evolution of 3D chess. This is, simply. You can do things virtually that you cannot do in this world. 
I was just speaking to a lot of representatives that what's beautiful about gaming is, is it's not governed by, by, by things that, like God or gravity or, or things like that. You can do whatever you want. So, so my question is, especially to Yevin, because I've experienced a lot of hardship in this exact thing, is what's your advice to people who are in an industry that's not supporting them, who do not have sponsors, who do not have corporates, governments, anything. You're just alone. And, and when, you talk, when I'm talking about what, what I'm, yani, the main reason I'm asking you is because the problem I'm facing isn't corporate anymore or governments anymore, it's the players. The, it's not that they've been losing their motivation, it's just that they, they, they don't see the bigger picture because there's, there's, there's no sponsorships from the publishers coming to our side because the Middle East doesn't have any, uh, any data or anything dependable. So what's your advice on dealing with the players and, and making them believe that there's something there, that there's something in the future? Basically, uh, I manage an organization that uh, is located in CS region. We don't have any governmental support or anything like this, the same. Uh, but, of course, we have a huge media that was growing from the year like 2010. So, esports, it's the mix of professional like sports and media, of course. So in order to attract sponsors, you, you need to grow your media. Uh, your market is interesting for any of uh, representatives of any sponsors, I can assure you. So all you need is to work with players in terms of their media activities, in terms of building their own brands from each guy. But I mean like the person-to-person the, 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 the -person relationship with the player. How can you convince him that there's something there that he, he doesn't see? You should show them cases. There are a lot of successful guys. There is Samail from Pakistan. He's, yeah. He won the Dota player, one yeah. and a half million in 16, when he was 16 years old. There is Dendi who's playing like 10 years. He, I can't walk with him all over the world like Dendi! <laughs> It's impossible, yeah. And he's from not from capital of Ukraine. He's from Lviv. He's he was just a guy. He became a gamer in his room, basically. So I don't see the problem. Okay, no, no, it's not a problem. It's just the players. For the first three months, I did what you were saying. For the LOL players, I showed them SKT. For the Counter Strike players, I showed them Navi, VP, all of the all of the teams, but. It kinds of keep, wears. Keep doing this. I do. I do every single day, but it wears off. But you have to keep doing it. Never give up. Never give up. Yeah, of course. I love your passion. I mean, your passion is here. How many other people are there like him? You know, who are there? You're, you know, so keep that passion. Never I give believe up. you. <laughs> you just never give up. You have to keep doing. You're a pioneer. You should be proud to be a pioneer. It, it sh I mean, shouldn't we be proud of these guys? It's amazing. Congratulations. Just keep doing it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can I can I add some, something? Um, Absolutely. You know, so actually, one of the, the guests from Japan, the Mr. Umezaki, is, uh, is the number one the esports team in Japan today. Three years ago, he had nothing. You know, I, I'm in for a sponsor. You know, I'm the lo working for the Logitech. He had nothing, but he has only passion. Came to me, and he told me that you know commitment of his team. Now, after three years, he's the number one. He's the most profitable team in, in Japan. And even other guests from Japan, as uh, uh, called uh, Tani, Mr. Taniuchi, Taniuchi san, uh, he used to be an FPS player, and he's uh, one of the top in uh, for Asia as a for FPS player. Now he, after the retirement, he's doing a coach, and he's working for an Nvidia. So even uh, you know, it's a passion for the playing a game, and after the retirement, people are watching you. So I think that there is so much in the potential. Just you know, who give, you know, please do not give up. There's a, um, quite a, there's a school of thought um, for success in, in sport um, of 10,000 hours that uh, anyone for any sport, if they practice for 10,000 hours, beca can become you know, the best, well, not said best, but in the professional area. So it is just a matter of keep on knocking on the door, keep on trying, keep on going, because it will take time, but uh, there's always that light. Absolutely, and I think we have time for one more question out there, if someone has uh, an idea. All right, over here. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Ignat Bobrovich from Game Show. You know, I was, uh, I'm very excited to see people from real sports and from esports here on the stage. 
And I was thinking a lot about the, the values of v sports. And you know, you have this Olympic L2, C2, Sportus, faster, higher, and uh, longer. How is it? Yeah, and about esports, uh, my question is about esports. What will be future esports games? Because, like, for now, the majority, or at least half of the games which are most popular, are about destroying or killing. Uh, how do you think uh, what will be next and will continue these games uh, to be most popular esports? Or some other new formats will come up uh, on the stage? Uh, Counter Strike is like 17. Yeah, 17 years old. I, I'm having a forecast about 20 years more. And MOBAs as well. So still, the destroying uh, and killing. I mean, maybe, yeah, of course, why not? Uh, maybe uh, some Counter-Strike uh, mode with like mapping and VR will appear. I think you... A problem that we have in the industry is that, uh, as uh, David touched on earlier, we have a player base playing games, which is 50% women, 50% men. But in esports, those numbers do not match. So there could also be a question that are we supposed to select games that's more suiting for women in order to get more women on playing esports? And what kind of games would those be? Um, in order to, like, predict which games will be big, that no one has ever succeeded in guessing that <laughs> throughout the, East, the years of eSports. No one has ever known which games will be big. Even the publishers don't. So, but I think we, we ought to look at which kind of games would attract other than the, the people who are playing eSports right now. That's right, and particularly with, with women. And that's a whole other issue of putting women, you know, getting more women involved in STEM in the beginning, right? In tech and all that, and gaming and developing. So that's a, a big issue, not just as players, but also developing and in leadership positions where they can make those decisions and encourage those decisions, and people can finance the projects that are aimed towards the women's market. Very important area. Yeah, but what games do you expect to be for women? Like a yeah, it's an open question. <laughs> I don't think anyone is very... Uh good at predicting the future like that, so... They like to kill and heal as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one follow-up. So I think Ignit has raised a very important point that, you know, so today esports is all about, you know, killing and destroying. Uh, but, uh, the, you know, answering to his question that, you know, what kind of games or, you know, what kind of uh, games actually we can include which is not destruction and not killing. I think Dance Central is one of the properties which ESWC also holds the world championship. So, which definitely is not killing, not destroying. So, I think those kind of games uh, eventually will evolve. So, I hope that gives some insight onto your question. Please, thank you. And thank you all for your time and your attention for this, uh, this panel. That will conclude this panel. And I uh, just want to uh, ask for one more round of applause for our panelists. And thank you for your attention.